it recording. We can right. start. Okay, welcome to the webinar. Uh, you'll have seen the uh, advert when you signed up for Eventbrite. We have five contributors representing very different views and perspectives for education development. I'm your compare with two roles. One is to make sure that people stick to their five minutes. And secondly, I'll be managing the questions because we've got a very large audience. We'll be doing questions through the online chat. So please put comments, questions into the online chat and we'll bring them into the conversation. So without further ado, I will hand over to David Kernahan, who many of you will remember from his time in JISC and his long, long association with CEDA, and who is now writing really wonderful stuff for Wonky. So if you haven't read him already, you should be reading everything he writes for Wonky. David Kernahan, your five minutes starts now. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invite. It's always great to talk to uh, CEDA. It's the group I feel particularly close to, and it is nice to see a few familiar names in the list on the group chat on the side. I'm not going to uh, respond to the group chat during my conversation because it's just too much information to take in, but I will try and do so afterwards. So I'm going to take a general perspective of what's happening in higher education policy. The big issue on the horizon is recruitment and linked to recruitment university funding. This is a an acute problem in England and Wales. It's an issue to a lesser extent in Scotland because they have a slightly more sensible funding system. The issue as it stands, students that are looking to apply to university or return to a university course do not know what they're going to be getting in September or October. They don't know if it is going to be the in-person uh, tuition, the campus experience that is is what they have generally tended to go for unlike in the past, or some kind of blended and hybrid model or a completely online model such as they have experienced in the summer term of this year. Um, this particular, the particular impact is on international and postgraduate students as far as I can see. Postgraduate courses are often only for one year. Uh, the fees are higher than undergraduates. Students are very clearly paying with their own money in many cases um, and a detriment to postgraduate students would have a disproportionate effect on their course but there's also an impact on undergraduates which is where the majority of providers get the bulk of their income as regards students. Um, Providers are also facing financial pressures with accommodation, um, with conferencing, with pretty much every aspect of running a physical university. Income streams are down, but the costs are still as they are. Um, so there has been a lot of concern about what this will mean for universities. For me, uh, the pain will really hit in January, February, March of next year. This is linked to the way the government has responded. They've not offered the bailout that was anticipated on and was asked for. They've offered some reprofiling of funding which is, uh, means that a lot of fee income institutions would be getting in January is being brought forward to September. Uh, this isn't additional money, this should, uh, just means they have more money at the start of term which means uh, commensurately they will have less money in uh, January. Uh, the other notable government impact is access to the uh, financial support schemes available to all businesses. Whereas these are great, we're talking about stuff like uh, the business uh, continuity loan schemes and the furlough schemes, where these are great for a lot of businesses that are seeing a loss of business and there's a lot of income now. They're not well designed for universities who will be seeing a loss of income starting in September and as I say, largely hitting in July. So although we are hoping to see an, uh, a more government uh, movement on this issue and we think we, there might be some more announcements to come, we're not really holding our hopes up for the kind of proper bailout that would put the university sector on the secure footing it needs to be if it's going to plan for the future. Um, so 
the government has also been making noises in England particularly about low value courses, about uh, providers addressing particular skills needs, particular local needs, particular research needs. This is a much more interventionalist approach to what actually happens in higher education than we've seen in previous years. Um, in previous years, the government has just let the market do the work. It's let the funding follow the choices, primarily of 18-year-olds just out of A-levels, but of all students. Um, there are indications that this may stop, that there are particular courses that the government does not see of value and does not want to support, that there are particular courses that the government sees as being of particular value and wants to offer uh, kind of more support. We're starting to see this with the extra support offered to nursing students, although we know that's still not uh, um, back to where it was in 2016. And I think other areas will start to see investment where uh, government sees them as important. We were expecting a consultation this spring on the, the Office for Students uh, funding method. This, this has not happened because of COVID, but um, we can start to see what may have happened. I've got one minute left, good grief. So what we've been dealing with at the moment is a, um, a crisis response. People have been calling it online teaching. It's not, it's emergency teaching. It's what has been possible to, to lash together in a few short weeks, primarily over Easter. It's just about good enough. It's not great. And it's not a, a, a sensible basis for an online offer in September. So there'll be lots of work to do on online development over the summer ahead of new uh, um, um, courses that may be delivered primarily online. Uh, the issue particularly are those of accessibility. Online courses are not suitable for all students with particular learning needs, a lack of a sense of community and problems with the technology. Not all students have access to the technology. So the future for education development, in the short term, it will be supporting and developing these online courses. There's going to be a bunch. I'd love to see the CEDA people working closely with the Association for Learning Technology, ALT, in coming up with the most appropriate teaching methods for these partially online, partially offline courses that will happen in September, looking particularly at blended modes of teaching and parallel modes of teaching where the same content is available in purpose and online to suit different student groups. And that's slightly over my time, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we haven't got any specific questions so far. Um, except for one that I thought would, would comes out of the press lately. There's lot, lots of uh, speculation as to whether some universities will go under, whether we'll say uh, because of all the financial restrictions. Uh, we simply don't that? know. There will be some stuff on Wonky on Monday that might help to bring about an answer. It depends a lot on the existing financial exposure to risk that uh, providers have got a lot of providers are in a pretty good space financially and may with a little bit of extra borrowing and unfortunately the likely specter of staff cuts. I don't think we can mince words on this. There are probably um, staff cuts on the way in all parts of nearly all universities. It is not going to be a pleasant year and we need to just take that as a starting point. But, you mentioned the collaboration and there's a question come up in the chat box as to how do you think that sort of collaboration between CEDA, Advanced HE, Aldean and Alt, how, how might it be achieved? Well, these are nice people. Um, I know that there are, um, the, the, there are many people that are members of CEDA that are also members of these other groups or associated with these other groups. Uh, CEDA has got an enviable reputation. It's got the historical clout and it's got the expertise to be a partner in these organizations. There, there, I think, should be an approach to these organizations on um, a corporate level, but also the individual contacts that uh, members have, I think, are going to be really, really important. It's all about what individual members can do as well as what the organization can do. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we are actually thinking of this as a series of webinars and ironically, the technology emphasis is probably our next port of call. So we're hoping yes. to set one up on those. So um, explain the term parallel teaching. Is that 
that's not a term from the research that's a term i have made up it's just an expression of the reality um it's an expression of reality that some students will be able to access at least part of their teaching on campus some students perhaps those more at risk perhaps those internationally perhaps those that for every reason do not want to travel to the university city may be experiencing the same content online how can we be sure that students get the same experience or a comparable experience online and offline that's a big question that we have to deal with okay thank you very much david um if we move on the we've had a question on the chat box about education development is it at risk i'll save that if i may till the end and we can ask all our contributors to chip in on that so thank you david okay, uh, thank from, you. A, from a national perspective we now move to uh, annie annie hughes from kingston who's running a uh, a center the head the learning and teaching enhancement center at kingston and annie over to you Thank you, Peter. I can't think of a more interesting time to be responding to the question, what will happen to educational development? Um, given the recent rapid move to, and I appreciate the difference between online learning and teaching and online learning support, which is really what we're doing at the moment, educational development teams in, in universities across the world have suddenly become more visible to higher education leaders um, uh, and have kind of surfaced as, as key players. Um, I say become visible because um, educational development has rarely, I think, been considered as business critical. Um, indeed, educational development has been in many ways the poor relation uh, to quality assurance in higher education in terms of both its status and also its resource base. Um, of course, educational developers themselves and many are, are, are on this, this call have for many years acknowledged that, that their marginal position um, and sometimes uncomfortable position actually in their own institutions. So the question about um, our ed dev teams um, uh, under threat is an interesting one. Um, however, I argue that um, ed dev teams play actually a vital role in supporting um, higher education institutions to successfully meet office uh, for student conditions relating to quality uh, and standards uh, and also to meet their institutional targets as set out in the AP and P plans, their access and participation plans. So uh, contrary to popular belief, Q QA processes don't actually themselves improve student, student outcomes. So um, I, I, I do believe that if institutions get their educational development enhancement right, and they have a culture whereby staff and course teams engage routinely with a, with a robust and effective educational development offer, then quality assurance only need really be light touch and, and, and very much risk-based. Um, and when aligned with, um, or, or aligned centrally with, with academic business um, of the institution, and, and of course championed by senior leadership, um, the ed, ed D function um, can coordinate key players um, in institutions to, to ensure the successful outcomes for students. And previous academic scholars, um, academic development scholars, have, have described this as, as, uh, as our brokering role. Um, obviously, the structures, the remits, the priorities of, of ED teams will differ depending on their institutional context. Um, however, to address the current challenges in higher education, um, our ED dev teams need really to be enabled to work much more closely and routinely across many institutional fun uh, functions. I, I want to talk very briefly in the five minutes I've got um, to discuss um, three of these constituents. Um, and of course, I recognize that as individuals, um, educational developers have been working across, across these spaces for, for many years, but they've been in the margins. They've been, um, I think Little and Green um, talked about betwixt and between, uh, rather than actually enabled and empowered to. To, to, to do this work through university structures. And that the first constituents I, I want to, to mention is, is the relationship between um, EDD and um, institutional research and planning teams. My experience of working um, with, um, on um, the BME attainment gap 
has convinced me of the power of robust data to act as catalysts for change um, and to galvanize staff to, to address the required shifts in academic practice. Our student cohorts are, are changing, or at least they're changing in some institutions. I'm thinking, for example, the growth of um, commuting students, um, 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 the, the growth in students that are coming to university with alternative qualifications, BTEC particularly notably in my mind, uh, and the growth of, of first generation students. And academic teachers need to be cognizant of these trends uh, in, in their cohort demographics. And institutional research uh, groups or teams can produce the data, but they are rarely the right fit to guide staff through the implications of these changes on, on their practice. The second constituent is how ed, te, ed um, D teams are enabled to work much more closely with what I call student support or student achievement functions in universities. Um, ed de, um, dev departments are very well placed, I think, to support student success teams to embed uh, their programmes in academic curricula um, through their work on course enhancement. And this is particularly important, and certainly for my institution, for the success of non-traditional students who often prioritise the academic curriculum um, and engage much less frequently with the co-curricular offer. Um, working, I think, with ed dev teams will enable a shift from an institutional model which purports to fix the student uh, to one which supports fixing the fit, the fit, I should say, between the students and their, their curricula. Uh, and finally, ed dev teams, I think, need to be enabled, particularly through these, these challenging times, to work directly with students and, and, and have the student experience being, being central to, to what we do. Um, my team employs students to support our curriculum development work. Um, the the programme, the Inclusive Curriculum Consultants programme is led by the Learning and Teaching Enhancement Centre um, and not by a traditional student facing team. And this I think is crucial to the, to the success of, of EDD. Uh, and it's interesting that again with a, an, another institutional restructure we had to, to have uh, fight the battle again about ensuring that these student uh, focused pieces of work sit within ed development. So in summary then, ed development teams in my view, and I would say this is a head of learning and teaching enhancement, are actually critical to the success of universities um, and their students going forward. Um, however, their effectiveness is often hindered, I think, by university structures and, and misplaced assumptions. But I'm hoping that the current crisis uh, brought about by this um, really horrible, deadly um, virus might in fact surface the importance of this, um, this team of people and, and, and what is often an under-resourced but absolutely highly effective institutional function. But thank you. Thank you very much. Um, given the various audiences that you've suggested there, I'm picking up on a point that's in the chat box. Uh, with planning in particular, perhaps, where would you start in terms of fostering new relationships? Um, I think it's very useful. And what, we, what we've tried to do in, in certainly my institution and, and, and the EdDev team have been the facilitators of this is bring together the planners, the data analysts with um, uh, colleagues, faculty colleagues, um, and and with the the um, ed development team in um, academic monitoring and enhancement um, workshops. So embedding it within the QA process. So we know stuff have to do QA. It's often a tick box exercise, but if actually we can ensure that that that, that we do the enhancement through that process, um, then we can uh, we can align the, those those areas. Um, so that you know, that's one way of of, uh, of aligning um, uh, those those areas, and what, certainly one way we we've tried to do that in our own institution. Okay, I think that is a, an issue that we will return to in the later chat. Actually, I note the comment from David Kernahan and their quant and qual together, an age-old recipe for success. Um, from the perspective, then, thank you, Annie. From the perspective of someone who's head of a learning and teaching enhancement centre, uh, I. Do a different perspective with a particular focus on how they've re reinterpreted the PG cert and professional development at Bradford. Ruth, can you take over, please? I can if I'll just share my screen. 
portal. Nothing seems to be happening. Oh, it is. Right. It looks like it's working. Everybody yes. got it? Yep. Great. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ruth Whitfield, Senior Educational Developer in the Directorate of Learning, Teaching and Quality Enhancement at the University of Bradford. I lead a team of four educational developers and two digital learning developers. And I agree with Annie that um, we're, we've actually become very vis visible and have been working very closely with senior management of late. Um, some of you will know me more from programme focused assessment, uh, but this afternoon I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour, and it will be a whirlwind tour of our new scheme, which is called Bradford Fellowship Scheme. It was launched in January 2020. Um, so it's very new um, and it has full accreditation by Advanced HE for all four categories of fellowship and it's seen as a key enabler for the corporate new corporate strategy that's been developed. Um, it dispenses, as Peter said, with our PG cert. Um, it still supports probation and it integrates several former separate frameworks um, to create what I hope is a simpler and a more easily navigated offer. So it provides a holistic um, whole career framework that takes staff from induction right through to National Teaching Fellow. Um, if you want more detail on it, I will be uh, presenting at CEDARS conference at the end of the year, so you'll get more detail there. Let's take a look at the scheme, if I can get my screen to move on which I don't seem to be able to do. There we go, okay. Um, so it begins with an induction. Um, the induction serves as an induction to learning and teaching at Bradford, uh, as well as to the scheme itself. So it's a mandatory element for all new staff. Um, it's primarily online and has a, a pass-fail element. So we wanted to be sure that um, everyone understood the context within which they were working um, a, a context which is changing quite rapidly. On successful completion of the induction, um, that acts as a gateway to one of three pathways that you can see there. The Graduate Fellow is a Bradford specific pathway for our postgrads and is essentially a ticket um, for postgrads to engage in teaching at Bradford. The top pathway is for those with less than three years um, teaching experience and it focuses on D1 and D2. It draws on the teaching from the former PG cert and the materials from that have been repurposed for online learning um, and that serves as a probation requirement. And then the experience pathways for those with more than three years teaching and focuses on D1 to D4 and essentially is our previous recognition scheme. So those are the three pathways. After successful completion of the pathway and professional recognition, we've introduced um, an outduction process, which encourages participants to reflect on the learning that has come from participation in the scheme. Um, those who have got professional recognition, we ask them to consider how they're going to remain in good standing for advanced HE's code of practice. Um, and to, to plan the next stages of their development. And that could involve re-engagement with the scheme in the future. So you might get a fellow who wants to re-engage and go for senior fellow in the future. Or they may want to work towards Bradford Teaching Fellow, which is the rebranding of our Vice Chancellor's Teaching Excellence Award. And that leads to, or they could go directly to National Teaching Fellow if they have the evidence to be able to do that. We're just taking our first, um, our first cohort of experienced people through the outdoction process, so I'll have to report back on that in, uh, in December. In terms of characteristics of the scheme, um, we have three entry and submission points each year. Um, the online space is quite unique in that it brings all cohorts and pathways into the same space. And we have one set of materials serving all cohorts and pathways. And the diagram shows the schedule for the D2 top pathway. And the dotted lines that you can see indicate um, the three submission points for the experience pathway. But the one on the left is also the exit point for graduate fellows. 
and the one on the in the middle is the exit point for D ones. Each topic one area left, has, Ruth. Thank you. Each topic area has tutor input at the beginning, and then staff are guided to CPD activities. The scheme's actually been really valuable during COVID-19 as we've been able to tailor those CPD activities and to meet the current challenges, which has made us much more agile. Um, and that's been done without too much disruption uh, to the progress of participants and, and the integrity of the schemes being maintained throughout. We've got 150 people engaged in the scheme. It's early days, but seem, things seem to be good at the moment. We've had the largest crop ever of applications for the experience pathway, and we're already receiving registrations for September. So definitely a whirlwind tour, but hopefully you get the favour of Bradford Fellowships. And I hope uh, I might see some of you in, in December to be able to give you more detail. Thank you. Thank you. One, one quick question, uh, Ruth, please. Yeah. Uh, what was the main driver behind getting rid of the PG cert? Um, we did an options appraisal. Um, we'd had a restructure. We had, a, at that point, we had a reduced team to what we have now. And it was just really a pragmatic way of being working, being able to work more effectively and more um, cost effectively and within the right resources that we had. And we had lots of different separate schemes that people were finding quite difficult to navigate uh, with different timescales, different start dates, etc. So we're hoping that this has simplified things for people. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and reactions to the scheme so far? Um, very positive. We've had some good feedback so far, yes. And I'll be it. giving details of that in December. In December. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, another plug for the conference in December, um, <laughs> which we'll, I dare say we'll mention again at some point. Okay. So you've 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 heard two um, comments, perspectives there from education developers. We wanted to bring in a different perspective from, if like somebody at the sharp end of teaching. Jonathan Ridley is head of engineering at Solent. Uh, over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for, for the invitation to come and talk. Uh, so obviously it's, it's a challenge for, for all of us from all sorts of different directions at the moment and, and very difficult to predict what's going on in the near future, but we can certainly do our, our best to, to plan from it. So I want to talk really from the, the point of view perhaps of, of STEM teaching and the, the development of STEM teaching and what might be the, the new normal. Um, my background in particular from, from my institution is teaching and working with students on STEM courses related to the shipping industry where our students do modules aboard ships at sea, or in some cases in Antarctica, uh, where there's not really much in the way of internet connection. So we've got quite a lot of experience of, of distance learning and blended learning with students. In uh, that, that background quite challenging. Uh, we know really that, that all students, but, but STEM students in particular, learn best by, by doing things and by being in a laboratory or by doing practical sessions. Uh, and in fact, to the extent that before COVID, we were looking, um, we were planning for the next academic year to reduce some of the face-to-face -face teaching, replace that with some blended learning, online learning, and use those hours instead in laboratories to give students more time in practical sessions, more time in laboratory sessions, because we felt there was much more value to their, their learning there. Um, so there's obviously clearly a, a big challenge with, with COVID and with the, the teaching approaches that we'll have to take up from September in being able to, to provide this. Um, we think that really the, the laboratory sessions and the practical sessions for STEM students have value in them, first of all, in, in the experiential learning of setting up an experiment and doing an experiment, but then recording the results of the experiment, analysing the results, then most importantly, reflecting on those results and saying, well, how could I improve it? And going back and completing the whole experiential loop by repeating the, the laboratory, repeating the experiment, refining results and data as, as we, we would do in, in reality. So some real, real challenges there. Um, it's, there's, there's two sides to it. There's the, the student experience of the laboratory and the learning from the laboratory, but also how do we get to, how do we work on staff development skills to be able to, to support students um, perhaps doing some work more remotely than they would have done originally. Um, there are lots of, of options on the table. There are, are lots of companies that are suddenly offering almost sort of the gamification of, of laboratories where you can walk into a virtual laboratory on your computer and pick up some equipment and, and work with it. 
um, but they tend to have quite a sort of funnel of the workflow. Students don't have the opportunity to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. They're instantly corrected and they don't go in this, this experiential loop. Um, so I don't think those are, are particularly good. Um, but also actually from, from the point of view of staff, what we find is that some of the best learning goes on when you interact with students in a laboratory session. So you ask them why they're doing something, you discuss their process with them, you help them perhaps to reflect on what they're doing there and then and to refine their process. And that's, that's very valuable learning, not just for the students, but also from the staff in, in understanding how students go about problem solving and dealing with a task. So we need to be able to find a way of, of replicating that to a certain extent. Um, Clearly as well, there's a challenge if we are fortunate enough to be in laboratories from September that we're very likely still to have a two metre rule. So even if staff can talk to students from two metres away, it's very difficult to stand next to a student and talk to them about what they're doing, maybe help them tune or set up equipment, help them find faults. Um, we, we've got a, a colleague at the moment who's trying to work out how to, to sync together an iPhone and a tablet so that they can put their iPhone on the desk next to the student, walk back two metres and use the uh, effectively Zoom on a very on a macro scale to, to support students with their work. So there's, there's lots of challenges like that, that that we need to overcome. But again, it's how do we, we get staff to, or how do we identify the skills that staff need and develop those skills to support students? Um, I think though, to be honest, perhaps the, the single biggest challenge with all of this is actually helping students with poor internet connections or, or no internet connections. And I know this, this runs across all of academia, not just STEM, uh, but for a lot of our work, potentially we might want to, uh, for instance, use Zoom to webcast live laboratory sessions where students can use the chat function to discuss what's going on and to debate and reflect and, and guide the, the lecturer doing the laboratory work. Uh, but obviously a student with a poor internet connection is going to struggle. And, the reality is that lots of students do have very temperamental and very poor internet connections um, and it's it, it gets really I think the the underlying theme of it is we need to be incredibly careful with inclusivity and, and a fair student experience for lots of different students um, I, I have one student in a quite a panic at the, the start of the COVID crisis because they simply didn't have a broadband connection at home and they said they couldn't afford a broadband connection at home and can absolutely empathize and understand with that um, but it's how do you how do you help a student like that to get the best of their potential and to be able to take part in in these interactive sessions that that really do make the, the vital building blocks for for their knowledge and understanding. Um, I'm not sure there there is an ideal solution, but there's uh, certainly a, an interesting debate and discussion over the next couple of months as we we try hopefully to get everything in place for September. I think that's that's pretty much all I've got to say on my my five minutes. I mean, do you, uh, just to pick up on that last point you mentioned about the internet connection, because I know that's plaguing just about everybody, do you have any set sense of a remedy or a, a way forward on that? Uh, there's a couple of different options. We've, in the past, we've looked at applications that a student perhaps could have on their, their phone or a tablet or an iPad, which when it did find an internet connection, as if a student was out and about maybe, um, that it would do a, a data dump and it would download a large amount of data and upload a large amount of data. So students could work on a VLE effectively in real time, but it would only connect and, and transfer data periodically. So that's, that's one particular option. Um, to be honest with some of my students currently on, on STEM based courses who are working at sea, uh, we still do print out notes and post them um, mm. because in, in some places that's that's the most reliable way to be able to get data. Um, but um, when I teach courses in renewable energy and sustainability, you know, chopping down a tree and posting it halfway around the world seems uh, a little counterproductive. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps uh, I'm just uh, seeing the chat uh, line. Perhaps we're going going to go back to some uh, examples of conventional distance learning. Perhaps to... absolutely, yeah. And I, I I can remember as a kid growing up, my mum was doing an open university degree, and we'd go down to the post office with her and collect a parcel of bits of laboratory kit that she'd take home and set up in the kitchen. And it's, um, it, we may well be actually going back in in that direction where we we post kits to students for them to be able to do uh, safe experiments. I don't think we'd be wanting to post anything particularly dodgy to students in, in terms of health and safety risks but yeah perhaps experiments in the home as part of learning could well be a, a way forward. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Jonathan. Uh, we started with a, a national perspective from the UK, uh, we now very happy to welcome Charlie from China, if you could uh, over to you Charlie and tell us a bit about your context and how you've, I think you've managed to resolve all this crisis and all these problems haven't you? Um, yes, 100% solved. Uh, Thank you, Peter. No, we are in the midst of everything. I'm going to use the chat, I hope, successfully while I'm talking. 
Um, I've identified really four main themes, but a lot of what everyone said is really resonant with us. And I think the, the, the thing that comes across to me most without considering the themes I thought about before is um, something David said about the three modes of learning, the blended, the face-to-face, -face, and the parallel learning. We're doing this too, and uh, you know, because the airports are closed, so some of our students aren't here, some of our staff aren't here, and uh, it's very confusing for staff to be asked to think about three different modes of teaching when they used to think about one. You know, we did everything online this uh, semester, and even that was rescue pedagogy of varying success, and uh, we learned a lot. But looking to the future, I think this interaction is symbolic of connectivity and participation, which I think is, from an international perspective, a crucial theme for us. So often, um, I hear about events in the UK with developers and I can't go because of course it, I can't get on a train. It's too far. So the idea that um, we're seeing more fellowship around the world, and this is some little thing I cut out from the uh, 2020 May Advanced HE newsletter I got today, uh, just showing people are, are in different places, getting fellowship all the time and professionalizing. and. Um, also with the Queensland University of Technology, they have an indigenous program, which will be a later theme. So connectivity and greater participation, which is something I think David also mentioned in the chat when Annie was talking, are key for your international community members. And this has really opened up a lot of access to knowledge, information, and peers for us. And so, you know, yes, it's been a huge struggle, but that's also been one of the positives for us. And I think that really feeds in to my second theme, which would be um, professional standards frameworks. Um, the Ako Arunyi appeared for me last summer, and it's um, the Maori version of the UK PSF. And as soon as I saw that, being a developer that uses the UK PSF in China, I thought, okay, I need a Confucian one. We have to make this and, and offer it to staff to internationalize, to decolonize the curriculum, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then I noticed um, Abby Cathcart in Australia is doing this at QUT, and uh, that was in the um, Advanced HE newsletter just today. So um, I think we're gonna see the growth of professional standards frameworks that are still aligned to the UK PSF but with different flavors and textures. And um, I see this in other bits of scholarship like um, futurisms. I work on Sinofuturism and, you know, there's an Afrofuturism, of course, that's been around since the 1960s. There, there's Islamofuturism, but now almost anybody with indigenous identity and, and scholarship of PSFs because we want to represent local values while still identifying with like global leadership and quality assurance. So that would be theme number two. Uh, theme three, I have less information for because I don't really know what's going to happen, but rather than flying faculty, we now have grounded faculty. So everything that people are doing around the world, both with students coming to them and with faculty going overseas, has been problematized by COVID-19. And this will result in um, sort of new ways of doing things, new partnerships that involve people on the ground thinking uh, about how to actually serve the needs of learners and what's the best way to do that. Will it all be through things like uh, video conferencing and what's lost with that in terms of development um, and it's mainly not just standing next to people, as Jonathan mentioned, that's, that's key, but it's also the conversation after, or like Jonathan was talking about the conversation about what's going on, talking about the process of learning. That's also what we do as professionals. And so that's super important for us. Um, and we want to see more of that. And the idea that we can't be together because we're separated and grounded, means we'll have to find another way to do this. And the final theme I have identified, and I hope these links work, is professionalization. Um, 
I have gotten so much through associating with other developers in the UK and participating in CETA and SHED and HEA events that um, we really need something that's local. And I think probably you're gonna see communities all over the globe saying this. So um, we've slowly started CAPED, the China-based Association for Partnership in Educational Development. Right now it just lives on LinkedIn and we talk over the internet. But um, uh, what we want to do is be able to network more closely with people just like we're doing now and just like we do when we visit the UK. Um, and on that theme of sharing knowledge and networking, uh, I did a blog and uh, put up a bunch of resources I created for our staff at Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool, where I work, XJTLU, to support them with online teaching and online assessments. So anybody who wants to cut and paste it, you can take these materials and use them any way you want. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, and Charlie. That's, that's, uh, so you see a lot more international collaboration going, which I think is very encouraging for all of us. Is there anything, anything particular that you can suggest to the folk in the UK from your experience over the last couple of months, uh, either things to do or things not to do? Um, yes, I think, you know, uh, what we're doing now is, is rescue pedagogy. And so planning now is essential. I think you probably know that, but what to do, be human, um, Think about how you communicate. You're going to be over communicating in writing and sending 10,000 emails. Don't do that. Make videos for students. Um, it's very, very trying. So what I would say is now is the time, and this is something Anne mentioned, now is the time to be visible, to show leadership and to help because we can really demonstrate our value without relying on managerial uh, um, metrics. We can just do things to lead by helping people deliver quality education online. Thank you very much, Charlie. Okay, mm -hmm. well now, now I'd like to put it open to the, our community of contributors. And in particular, um, I'll read an, a, a, a chat message that's come from Kitty Ward. I'm a third year student who's just finished my studies. Before the 10 weeks of before COVID-19, 10 weeks of this year's teaching was affected by strikes. Really, can you and in the March, camp? we switched to online teaching. Should I be compensated because I was not given the standard of teaching that I was told I would receive as part of my degree? So I now pass that question on to members of the panel. Uh, who would like to step into the lion's den first? Um, I'd be happy to receive con Carry on, David. Okay, uh, so uh, firstly, uh, Kitty, welcome to the webinar and welcome to uh, CEDA. I'd imagine this might be your first contact with uh, CEDA and you are very welcome here. Um, in terms of a refund, as I said in the chat, it's a very much a live question. There's lots of debate about this at the morning. At the moment, there are a number of moving parts. Um, I suggested you take a look at the website provided by the Office for the Independent Adjudicator for Higher Education. They have very good advice as to what students in your situation should be doing. From uh, my perspective, there is clearly a case for students uh, who have not received what they were expecting to be compensated in some way be that financially be that the opportunity to take parts of their course or exams at a later date but there is also an issue that that presents to universities if every student asked for a full refund and got a full 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 re fee refund from their university then pretty much every university would close and this is probably not the outcome you'd be looking for either um, in an individual circumstance, I can't really comment because I don't know your individual circumstances, but I would strongly advise you to talk to your university and to talk to the Office for the Independent Adjudicator and to read their advice. Thank you, Dave. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think... Um communicating with students at this time because they're going to be a lot of them unsatisfied or just alarmed at something unfamiliar is really key. 
So things like student staff liaison committees or surveys should be done more often. Uh, again, don't kill people with emails, but um, you need to let students know that their voices are heard and try to respond to those voices, not just nod your heads. Um, and it's, you know, that you're doing something new, now is the perfect time to do it in partnership and really, really help students to co-create education. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, the other question that uh, cropped up uh, throughout the, uh, as we were going through, that cropped up a couple of times, was the question of is education development at risk? And I wonder whether uh, we have an opinion on that. Perhaps I could point at Jonathan for that, because you're not a, uh, you're at the sharp end, but not an education developer per se. How do you see the education development role helping you and colleagues? I think that's, that's a very good question. Um, I think that there's, a, there's going to be new teaching skills required and, and new ways of, of delivering. And I think there's, there's very much a, a role for educational development in, in the future in seeing how we can support our colleagues develop the, the, the appropriate skills. Um, obviously, online learning and, and distance learning does require a different skill set and a, a different understanding and perhaps a different approach to, to classroom learning. Um, so I think yeah, educational development in the future, I think, is, is going to be even more important than it than ever has been, to be honest. Uh, it's, a, it's a new skill set, a new, new in, well, I don't like using the word industry, but it is a, a new, new industry and a new method that we may well be moving into. Yeah. Uh, a question perhaps for Annie or Ruth or either. Uh, one of the challenges for EdDev community, not all of us are experts in online learning and teaching. So how are people going to perceive EdDev in the future? I think that's a very interesting point and um, I mean certainly in my institution um, academic staff development and technology enhanced learning and uh, actually enterprise education all sit within the end the head um, sit within learning and teaching enhancement and actually that is absolutely crucial because we are all working together at this point very closely more closely than we've ever done um, to ensure that the, 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 the pedagogic theory of, of learning um, and the technologies are, are being um, considered together to ensure that our students um, or we provide the best possible experience for students going, going forward. So, and, and that's not the case in, in, in all universities. So I, I think it really has brought to, the, to bear that importance of, of, of technologies being the mechanisms, but actually the, the pedagogy and the, the learning and teaching being the absolute um, key uh, in an online or a blended or a face-to-face -face environment. Yes, indeed. Ruth, I, th I think you've been through several restructures in your time. I wonder if you, because you're now in a very different position to where you were in a, as an ed dev unit some years ago. Do you want to comment on the kind uh, of uh, I, engagement agree, at Bradford? I agree with Annie. We're, we're now based, educational developers and digital learning developers are now situated with uh, uh, quality business partners. And it's actually very useful to work together. but. Um, in terms of the technology, um, I think it's really valuable to have educational developers who are not very technical minded um, because often, often those who are um, comfortable with the technology want to move forward and don't always realise that it's actually taking lots of people way out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And so to have somebody who's not as technology minded who says, hang on a minute, if that was me, I'd be feeling like this, I think is hugely valuable. Yeah, okay. One final question from the floor and then I'll hand over to Carol David to, to wind us up. And the question comes from Rebecca, Becca McCarter. As we transition from supporting and delivering remote emergency teaching to planning multimodal learning and teaching for the coming year, what's the most important thing to do differently? You're on screen, Ruth, what's your answer? What's the most important thing to do differently for next year? Um, I think at the heart of it, we have to remember the students and, and think very carefully about what their experience is um, and how we're actually meeting that experience. And even with the best will in the world, technology is actually causing some students real headaches. It's causing staff real headaches. So I'm sure that, you know, we have to just realise that at the end of this, there is a student who needs a really good experience. Yeah. 
Does anybody else want to chip in on that before I hand over to Carol for our wind up? Uh, going, going. Yeah, I, I love what you said, Ruth. And I would say with that engagement has been something we have learned. People have to really design in engagement when you're thinking about a new environment to keep people there mentally and coming back. Okay. Well, that's a nice way to, to, to wind up our contributions. Thank you everyone for, for being part of the, the, the panel here. Uh, just to remind folks, as Ruth has already done twice, that she is part of the December conference, as is Charlie, and we look forward to seeing him in person in December. Uh, I'd now like to hand it over to Carol Davis, who's our CEDA exec co-chair, to say just a couple of things to wind us up. Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you very much to all our speakers and to all of you who have been in the audience. This has been a real, real pleasure. So I'll briefly sum summarize, um, speaker by speaker. David, thank you for your crisp analysis. And um, those of you whose institutions or yourselves as individuals are not subscribers of Wonky, put that right right away. Um, CEDA have just agreed a partnership um, with Wonky, so very excited about that. You raised um, the issues um, facing universities out of recruitment and funding and students not knowing what to expect when they arrive in September or choose not to arrive. You introduced us to the term parallel teaching, um, which I enjoyed, and you prepared for universities to fill the, get ready to fill the pain in 2021. Um, thank you for your appreciation of educational developers, but also a timely reminder that certain courses will be under threat. Um, and in answer to your question, yes, CEDA are palling up and continue to work very closely with the Association of Learning Technologies and also the um, Association of Learning Developers in Higher Education. Annie from Kingston University, you remind us these interesting times and how up to now educational developers have tended to, um, there's been a visibility issue, um, but now we are in the um, spotlight, the key players and seen as business critical. Um, you also reminded of us of access um, participation plans, the BME attainment gap, how these things are co-joined, a real step change and opportunity for educational developers to enhance um, the work of universities and the brokerage role, that of ourselves as, as connectors and working alongside others. Ruth, your expertise and experience um, through program-based assessment and the account of you repurposing um, the existing postgraduate certificate in higher education, um, being so cognizant of the development needed for academics and that importance of not assuming that all of us are comfortable with technology and the need to empathize with the academics and staff and professional services we, we work with. Um, such a positive, positive scheme. Um, and thank you for um, reminding us of the um, CEDA 2020 conference in, in December in, in Glasgow. Uh, we will not be defeated if we can't meet face to face, we will be um, on, on um, online. Jonathan, the STEM industry is so crucial. The reminder that um, our engineers um, and those um, um, learning and teaching in STEM learn best by doing the sweet spot is the labs the importance of interactivity and immediacy, problem solving. The challenge is now when you provided us um, with the need to give a good student experience and you offered practical examples that you and the team are working on and potential um, solutions to replicate the talk experience in a different way. You also, the sobering, um, importance of poor on internet connections, fairness, social justice, for everyone having the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Charlie, you, you, um, you ended for us um, the view for, from China, um, how confusing it is for staff to have so many choices under the remit of online um, um, learning. Um, I love, and I don't know whether you had um, invented this term, but rescue pedagogy, I would, um, weave that into my, um, my conversations, opportunities, knowledge, information, peers, 
networking. This is what we have seen um, post COVID and it is a beautiful thing. Um, flying faculty becoming grounded faculty. You've also told us what's happening in China with their um, educational developers, emerging professionalism and associations, the professional standards framework in China. Um, and um, that optimism that I think you gave us, serving the needs of learners, but also the good things that have come out of this. Thank you warmly from CEDA for joining with us. We are vibrant, supportive and inclusive community. We have never been so relevant. For more information, go to our website. Um, we're recording this. You'll have the slides and the words. Um, watch out for more webinars. Big thanks um, to Peter for his skillful and adaptive facilitation. Um, go well and have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Claire. Perhaps we should just end with a uh, thing that's just come out of the chat box. Uh, a quote from Sarah, is it Sarah Bird? Yes. Who said, you know, universities have ended up doing more work over the last two or three months uh, in terms of all the response to the crisis. I think universities should emphasize how hard they are working on this. So maybe we have a PR role to do there. And I think that's certainly from Somewhat, someone on the sidelines. That's certainly what I've seen. So I think there'd be lots of good, really positive messages of hope and good fortune here. So uh, we always try to end on time at Cedar. So thank you very much and goodbye. Go and enjoy the sunshine, folks. Uh, cheerio. Bye. Thank you all.